committee room 29. Okay, members, we are correct. Just mega start and kind of welcome us to the first first committee of this of this 2014 new year. So. Members, just remind you, electronic devices, all the kind of devices should be switched off, excluding your tablet devices that you're using to view your committee packs. Just a brief overview of today's business. The committee will receive a departmental briefing on the review of apprenticeships. The committee will also receive a departmental briefing on the summary sponsors of two-pay consultation. The committee will be briefed in closed session by the Northern Ireland Legal Service on the procurement process for Steps to Success programme. That legal advice will be in closed session, members. The committee will then receive a joint briefing by the departmental officials and Department for Finance and Personnel Central Procurement Division on the procurement process <coughs> for steps to success. Now, a brief overview of today's business. Members, apologies. I received one apology from David McClarty. No arms at the moment. Okay. <coughs> Members, just moving on to chairperson's business, um, I would advise members that a number of individuals named in the New Year's Honours list have links to the remit of the committee, either as department officials or through universities and colleges, and just advise members that letters of congratulations have been sent to the individuals. Also remind members of the committee at its plan they agreed to conduct its next inquiry on the provision available for those with learning difficulties leaving school. Members, the draft terms of reference is at page 5 of the pack, and also advise members there is a list of organisations for the committee to write to request and written submissions as at page 10 for members to consider. So members, if you, just, if you could take a look at those terms of reference and see if you are, I know they were circulated by the, the committee staff over the, over the holidays. Hmm? Must just be me seeing them there. As long as you're content. I was, I was, I was a slipper. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that in my notes either. For that. <laughs> <laughs> Members, those terms of reference, well, you have had a chance to see them since last week. They, I think they have been expanded. They have been expanded slightly to take on a, a wider scope, as I think was the committee's, committee's well. Members, are you content with the terms of reference, or do you want a minute or two to, to study them? Page five, Phil. I haven't got page one, Robin, let alone page two, three, four, five. <laughs> well, I said about that, remember. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, I've already read them. Do you see the, the, the list right of people who are going to be yes. wrote to? Uh -huh. I mean, can we add to that? Yes, yeah. Yeah. There's Oak Ridge and Dungallon. Page four. Just another. Page five. Yeah, if you think of anybody, okay. you just send me an email. That's and we'll send it out to anybody, anybody else, anybody thinks It's so. not a definite list. We can expand no, on the list. Yeah. list. Members, in the terms of reference, are you content? Yeah. Agreed. Robin, can I just okay. seek clarity on how we're going to make sure that this inquiry doesn't turn into um, the lengthy inquiry the last one was? I think I've, I've spoke to Cathy on this a number of times, and I think we have to be creative around this inquiry. Mm -hmm. I think we may have a number of evidence sessions in front of the committee, but I think we need to look at stakeholder events mm -hmm. and actually work on outside you know, the way we did the last inquiry. because. Yeah. It's a very detailed piece of work and we need to be doing it right and I think that has been agreed by all the committee members from the start. So we, we need to look at how we actually deliver it, not through just the evidence sessions that we've taken before because that it turns into a lengthy a lengthy session that we don't get the full use of. Well, have you anything any I, have, well, I was a member of the still a member of the ETI committee. We did a, an inquiry into research, development and innovation and it was the first time that a rapporteur had been appointed by the committee. And Robin Newton was the rap attorney, did a very good job. So it might be worthwhile if the committee considered appointing a, a rapporteur or, or an individual in the committee with a special <coughs> in this area to, to lead on engagement with stakeholders and things like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. could be an idea. Wrong. There also as well, just for something to consider, you know, even in my own constituency, there are a number of organisations yep. there. And maybe it'll be useful to do a stakeholder event within, you know, Tyrone, bringing all of those organisations together. 
and letting them have their views as opposed to individually up here? Uh, if... uh, no, I think we'd, 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 we'd well be going across the, going across right. the problems with that. You want to give them up the ideas? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to. What I was thinking of was, years ago when I was clerk at the ETI committee, we did an inquiry into tourism and travel uh, things, and what we did was we did two conferences, one west of the ban and one east yeah. of the ban, and we invited different, the stakeholders to each of the conferences, and then we actually hired moral communication <coughs> process where we hired them to help the event. So we had breakout groups and there was records kept of it all. And then it was all pulled together into a, a report of both stakeholders' events and we took all the evidence that way. And all we had was um, departmental officials, up the key stakeholders before the committee. And it meant you got it over and done with in two full days. Yeah. And then it took some time just to pull all the evidence together. But it was a way of getting yeah. everybody's yeah. views in. And yeah. you would group the people into the different areas according to the terms of reference as well. Mm. Right. To try and get it done much quicker. Yeah. Members have enough. We, we haven't tied that down yet. No, but no. We will be going if we can get the terms of reference agreed today. We'll put the notice out and then we'll bring back ideas of how we actually deliver mm. it. Members content? Yeah. Okay, members, in terms of reference agree, there's also then just a, a preempt, there's a draft public notice at page 14, so we can actually public, uh, publicise the inquiry. And you just, uh, members contend that the public notice is issued. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If agreed, the issue, this, this will issue next week as it needs to go into the newspapers five days in advance of publication. <coughs> the draft press release will be considered at next week's meeting to coincide with the public notice, so that will get us officially out there that are. Our next inquiry is underway, members. And Robin, will that be done online some way too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the the notice will go, presumably will go on the assembly website. It'll go on our website. We can, yeah. we can link uh -huh. through and whatever and send it. But it will go into the papers next Thursday. Yeah, okay. Key stage of it as well. Sure, can I just uh, to raise some? Because I, yeah. I know that uh, you, you go through and I hear even saying that what you end up getting is the, the usual suspects uh, and, and yeah. terms of listed read out and how you broaden that into a, 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 a community setting, you know. And, and uh, the, 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 there are areas neighbourhood renewal partnership boards. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 there are an areas uh, part uh, also uh, district partnership boards and things like that that have a, a strong Very community good. contact. Yeah. And it may not be a bad idea to invite them as a long down the yep. also. Certainly from yeah. the problem. And members, as I say, anybody else or any other organisations you feel would be would be beneficial mm -hmm. to, that's let us know. Members. Draft minutes, draft minutes of the meeting on the 11th of December 2013 are at page 16 of the pack. Members could, members who were there agree that was a record of the, of the meeting. Mm -hmm. So I sign as being correct. Members then, matters arising. Uh, page 23 is the agreed action points from the last committee meeting. Members agreed. Of those action points. Um, yep. Okay. Just advise members that it's meeting on the 11th of December. The committee agreed a number of actions relating to our briefing today on the procurement for the Steps to Success programme, and they've already taken place since the last. It was agreed that the committee write to the Minister of Employment and Learning and to the Minister for Finance and Personnel, personnel regarding its ongoing concerns in relation to the procurement process for the Steps to Success programme and to request that they pause the procurement process until issues regarding the robustness of the pre-qualification questionnaire have been satisfactorily considered by the committee, including that there is evidence of the ability of the organisations to deliver the contract and the supply chains where delivery of the contract are in place. Um, members, of the DFP Minister's response is at page 819 of the pack, just in case anybody hasn't had a chance to read that yet. And basically, so he's stop reading at 800. 800, you know, that's, that's, that's your limit for him. <laughs> that was my limit. It is, it is quite a big pack, members, I can assure you. Um, so basically, both ministers have come back to us, both DFP and Dell, saying that they won't be suspending the procurement process because by suspending they may actually open themselves to legal challenge as much as going on ahead without it. But we'll get that evidence through our, our session later on, members. Also, we agreed that the briefing by the Department and Central Procurement Directorate scheduled for the 15th of January should be rescheduled for an early date, if possible, and should be held in open session with the Minister in attendance to answer any concerns. Members, there is also correspondence sent from the Dell Minister, page 748. The Minister has received, or sorry, has responded, advising that it would be inappropriate for him to attend in this matter, but the Permanent Secretary will attend his place. The department are content to hold the briefing session and opens open session as well. 
Part with you, Levin. Okay. Robin? Yeah, Phil. Um, I think it's, it's <coughs> disappointing that, that the Minister isn't coming, but um, that, that's his decision, and I've spoken to him about it. Um, in terms of um, Simon Hamilton's response, um, he talks about how um, there are strict anti lobbying rules which re require the ejection from the competition of any bidder who lobbies. Um, but uh, quite a number of the organisations that were interested in going forward um, attempted to and were successful in, in lobbying this committee. Yeah. Um, how does that sit with this process? I don't know, Phil. We have, you know, we have the officials up later, and I think it's a valid question okay. to put to them because I know there was a round even after the stage one mm -hmm. was put out. There was a company that was both ourselves and the DFP committee mm -hmm. were approached by a number of stakeholders. So, a valid question to ask. But I'm talking about even before stage one was was put right. out for tender, yeah. there were organisations seeking to meet us as individuals and as committee, yeah. and there there are still organisations trying to do it now yeah, that have been successful in stage one. Yeah. I think because. They're very forceful. They're sending emails, and they've been ringing my office constantly, yeah. actually demanding meetings, and I'm just saying no to them. You know, but there's something badly wrong when they're able to appear to be to be canvas and this committee. I think there's something badly wrong. Yeah, mm. yeah I think uh, if we raise that with the officials, maybe they can respond to the, the, the organisations that have got through the stage, maybe just because I, I know I would, I'd, as you say, it almost comes through as if the, the, the meeting's already scheduled oh, in your diary, Pat, so I've had a couple of those myself, so but Phil, if you want to raise that with the, the officials when they arrive. Okay, members, just at the last stage, you're content that the legal advice will be in closed session, but you're happy enough that the meeting with the, the departmental officials will be an open session on recorded by Hansard? Yeah. Okay. Members, we also agreed to write to the department for a copy of a blank pre-qualification questionnaire and for information on the previous performance and other employment programmes for organisations that have been successful at stage one of the Steps to Success procurement pack, and those are at page 750. The department's responses is there. <coughs> the blank pre pre-qualification questionnaire is present because I know that's something we had requested before they give us that. Um, but I think in, in relation to those organisations that have got through to stage two, it was looking for their their experience. That's not within the scope of the department, I think, was basically their answer because they don't have they can't they can't release that due to competition rules or something. So again I think it's something we can't question, but just in the successfulness of the answers or the, the openness of the answers that members may want, maybe. Maybe something we can see how it develops later on. Great. Members, anything else arising under the matters arising from the Minister last meeting? Okay, thank you. Members, moving on to correspondence, as you as well see, the correspondence has quite quite lengthy in this. Uh, members are page twenty eight onwards. Um, members at page forty nine of the pack is a response from the North West Regional College regarding issues raised by Mr William Coyle. Members, anything to content to note? OK, members, content to note. Page 65 is the departmental response to the committee request for sight of the Minister of NR NWRC Governing Body meeting on the 13th of March and comment on correspondence received from one of the members of the review group. The minutes of the meeting of the NWRC Governing Body have been provided to members in a confidential pack. Members, of something we raised at the, the specific meeting we had with the NWRC, why those minutes hadn't been placed on the on the public domain on their website, and it was regard to the answer we got back was it actually referred, referred very specifically to one member of staff, so they can <coughs> those minutes are available through a confidential pack there, if anybody wants to see them. Are they available on the pack? The confidential, confidential pack. That's it, that, that the view have been given? Yeah. 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 There's a dark pack. No, it's a... Do you have a pad or do you want I don't have it, no, but I'll, I'll get one if it's available. Right. I'll, I'll get it. Yeah. Aye, I'll get you one. That's the legal advice. I the legal advice, I've been told here, so it's all in the same envelope. 
Members, then at page um, 82 and 86 is the correspondence from OFM DFM Committee regarding a recent delivering social change signature programme event and the departmental response. Members, just today, you know Chris Little attended the event uh, as a member of this committee and mm -hmm. the OFM DFM Committee as well. Members, anything arising out from that? No. No. Okay, members, page 87 is the Committee for the Environment request for a response into its inquiry into wind energy. It's outside the scope of this committee members, but we, we could ask to be kept up to date. And yeah, in, the, yeah. in the past, we'd written to all the universities and colleges about the renewable energy, so it may be worthwhile just forwarding on anything we've received in regard to that. Members, page 147 is the NISRA correspondence providing the January 14 labour market statistics. Content to note. Members, page 154 is the GL Education Group request to meet the chairperson regarding STEM, teacher training and wider vocational educational issues. Members, are you content that maybe myself and the vice chairman meet, the, meet them on the committee's behalf in an informal session? Okay, members, page 214, the Storm Mills University's College response to the committee correspondence regarding efficiencies made in the past two years. Members, any questions or content to note? Okay, members, page 222 through to 587 is copious resources response to the departmental correspondence and the request to meet with the committee and the departmental officials. Members, if you do remember, a copious presented to the committee and then the department come back and then there was a bit, and, bit of, of to and fro and copious has come back with quite a detailed response onto some of the queries. Um, members, they have requested that copious the department and the committee all meet to discuss through these. But at this matter of at this point of time I really see the the conflict or the, or the disagreement between copious and the department. So I think we should forward copious's Response to the department that they am encourage the department to meet with them. Yeah, sure. <coughs> yeah. I, 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 I wouldn't disagree with that, but I remember that when Copius came here, that uh, I think the committee was impressed by the, the information that you shared. Yeah, and, I, <coughs> and I'd asked the question afterwards, and that was uh, how much does the training cost and, and, and uh, what, what would be put in. But I think uh, all of us have probably been lobbied to some degree uh, by, by Copius. And they're seriously challenging <coughs> some of the, the, the information that's coming from the department that questions the accuracy of, of the, the information that we got at this, the, this committee. Mm -hmm. And it may not just be a case of saying get the department and copious together at some stage have they provided information that counters what the department's yeah. saying and to have them back here to try and go through at some stage. At some stage, but I think if we can get copious in the department together first to try and resolve their their differences there, I think, will be the first. Well, the department could keep us informed of how those yeah. are going. Either going on yeah. if they have any response. Sally? Uh, Chair, first of all, apologies for, for being here. Um, <coughs> but Sally, we need to watch that we don't get involved too deep in this. I mean, I was sitting at about half past five this morning through some of this stuff, and we can up early. Um, and I started reading some of those emails. There are hundreds of emails. Yeah. I mean, do you see, if you just start investigating. You, you would need a, a barrister in here to, to go through some of this stuff, to be quite honest. Yeah, but I understand fact, John, what, what Fran said. Yeah. But the, 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 the point that I'm making is that uh, the, the, during the presentation here, we were told that over the next 10 years there could be up to 50,000 jobs yeah. uh, offshore. Yes. Uh, what we've been told by the department is that that is not the case. Yeah. And I think so. Yeah. <laughs> it's trying to get a balance, or it's not taking anybody's side. It's, yeah. Just trying to get a balance. And, and for, I'm, I'm sure Phil will remember. I, I raised it. You with, can, you with can the let minister. me know what, what was in the hundreds of emails later on, yeah. somewhere, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I raised it with the minister. That's the response that I got back because I've said, and sister, are we talking about the potential of 50,000 jobs? And I certainly yeah. was very clear that, that wasn't wasn't the case. So, so taking on the right of putting copious in the department together and keeping this committee abreast. Yeah, that's fine. See how it goes on. Really? Okay, thanks, members. Members, page 587 is the departmental correspondence regarding its lit literature review on zero hours contracts. Oh. Members, happy to note. 
Note member, page 602 of the departmental response provides statistical information on the steps to work process. Okay, members, thanks. The note. And members, page 606 is the departmental response on the impact of employment schemes on mindset and employability of scheme participants. I really note as well. Okay, members, just actions as is suggested, uh, agreed, unless indications to the contrary. All agreed? Agreed. agreed. Members, two invitations. The first one's page 612 is a department invitation to the Plan Stakeholder Forum on the review of youth training to take place in the holiday in Belfast and the Glenavon House Hotel Cookstown on a number of dates from the 23rd to the 31st of January. Members, if anyone of you just want to attend any of those, if you let the clerk know, yeah. uh, we can organise your attendance or your interest at those. They are either side of the, the province as well. So. OK, members, page 614 is the invitation from the Committee for Education to attend the STEM School event in the Long Gallery in Parliament Buildings on the 29th of January 2014. Members, this has been put into our forward work programme as one of our meetings, so we're not actually, it is a Wednesday morning, so we're not meeting that morning to allow members to attend, good, to attend the session, ah. so I would encourage yep. members to attend. And I've been asked to, to represent the committee on the on the panel discussions. Okay, members, just advise members that the committee has also been provided with the annual report on financial statements for the year ended 31st of July 2013 for the six Northern Ireland colleges, and these have been emailed to members for their interest. It's the South West College Annual Report and Financial Statement, the South Eastern Regional College Annual Report and Financial Statement, Northern Regional College Annual Report and Financial Statement, Belfast Metropolitan. Metropolitan College Annual Report and Financial Statement, Southern Regional College Annual Report and Financial Statement, and the North West Regional College Annual Report on Financial Statement. So those are available members. Okay, members, draft forward work programme is at page 618 of your packs, and the schedule there is up until the 9th of April 2013 through to the Easter recess. So members, just as indicated, if there's any other briefings we may add as necessary, but just to note that the 29th of January has been logged out for the, the committee hosted event in the Long Gallery. Uh -huh. Members content with the draft forward work programme? Yeah. Okay, members, moving on then. Our, our first departmental briefing this morning is into the review of apprenticeships, the interim, interim report, and the consultation document. Members also tabled as a minister's statement which you gave to the House on Monday morning. <coughs> Members, can I just welcome Catherine Bell, CB, the Deputy Secretary, and Miss Yvonne Kroski, Head of Apprenticeship Review Team. It is very welcome, and um, thank you. over to you. Well, um, thank you, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. I have to <coughs> apologise for my vo voice. It's not sore, but it, it sounds worse than what it is. Um, but if the questions get too hard, I lose my voice. <laughs> um, just to say that I don't propose to spend a lot of time on an introduction because, as you know, the Minister did a fulsome statement on Monday. Um, uh, the apprenticeship review has been a result of extensive consultation and engagement with a wide range of stakeholders and also looking outside uh, Northern Ireland at, at best practice. Um, we've ended up with four themes, four big themes, which um, really is the components of an, uh, an apprenticeship, the uh, increasing participation, um, the roles of partners and ensuring quality. And under those four themes, there are 32 key actions. Um, this apprenticeship is different from anything that has gone before, and we truly believe that it will be transformational for our young people and adults, but also for employers and for the economy of Northern Ireland. So I think it would be better if I just left it then for questions now, if, if that's OK. OK, thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that was raised on Monday morning was 
Um, and I think I, I understand why we're moving apprenticeships from level two to level three. What is the department going to put in place for the people who would usually want in at level two? Okay. Um, when, when we started this work, the, the minister announced that he was doing a review of youth training and apprenticeships. Um, but it was then decided that we needed to get clarity on what was going to go into apprenticeships before we turned our mind to youth training. Now, that is not to say that stuff isn't happening on youth training, but uh, the Minister is very, very determined that um, there will be an opportunity for all young people to progress to an apprenticeship. So the new youth training programme, when it's designed and brought to the committee and debated, will allow progression from a level two into uh, a level three apprenticeship. Um, so there will be proper progression for those young people who are not just ready to take up an apprenticeship at level three. And that is incredibly important. Um, and we're working on that piece of work at the minute. Thanks, okay. Scott. Just a link to that then as well, Catherine. One of the one of major employers in my own constituency that was with last week advertised for 50 apprentices. 720 people responded. They interviewed 120 to pick out, and they eventually took on 55. Now, even with that reduction of pull, of the 55, they took on 30. Still needed essential skills yeah. training. Yeah. So there's 690 there that didn't make it through to that. Yeah. Fine. So we've no idea, you know, what their capability was. What work is the department doing with the Department of Education and to making sure, you know, that that groundwork's done on essential skills because that'll carry on from level two to level three. But yeah. The essential skills aren't there, it's one I mean, we absolutely agree, and, and as, as we went through the review of, of apprenticeship, <coughs> all employers said to us that it was absolutely crucial that young people came in ready with literacy and numeracy, um, at, particularly at GCSE or Level 2. Um, what we will do is we will absolutely make sure that a person going on to an apprentice before they go on to the apprenticeship scheme, if they don't have their literacy and numeracy, there will be an intensive programme um, to support them to get either a GCSE, if that's what an employer requires, or a level two in essential skills. Um, but we do work constantly with the Department of Education because our view is that young people should leave school literate and numerate. Yeah. And that if, if they don't, then we have got to pick up within the department through the essential skills strategy. And really, it would be lovely by this stage to be saying that um, the essential skills strategy is no longer necessary. But we do work closely with the, with the, the department on this. Um, under uh, uh, 14 to 19, we share responsibility for policy and, and we, we meet regularly and we'll be continuing to, <coughs> to make sure that we deal with this issue. Uh, making sure that we have the uh, building blocks in place to make sure our young people have math and skills uh, and English skills at, at level two. I mean, it's particularly it's it's important across all areas. I mean, if a person is not literate, it's very difficult for them um, to progress to the next level. But certainly in areas like engineering or ICT or any science-based area, if they don't have mathematics, then there is a real uh, concern. But they can't progress. It's as simple as that. Yeah. You mentioned ICT. That was also one of the things that was raised. And the employer I was talking about, the apprentices, they're, they're getting at the minute. They're actually saying, and he's saying, their ICT skills are actually falling away. Compared to, actually starting to fall away now compared to where they were five years ago. Now, and he said, well, what, it was actually the training and learning manager was telling me, he says, certainly social media, Facebook, all the rest of it, they're improving. Yes. But as per basic, basic ICT skills, they're starting to lose those. Is there anything we're doing there to put, embed that into essential skills from level two to level Well, we have a separate essential skills in ICT, and it is not social media. It is uh, Word, um, PowerPoint, um, Excel, um, that type of stuff. Um, and while that too is incredibly important, um, the other thing is that if you're going into areas like ICT or engineering, you need more than that. You need to start looking at programming. And that's why the ICT work that we're doing through the Minister's uh, working group is so important. And we're trying, I mean, college, some of the colleges are now running um, coding courses for young children. 
to get them interested in programming. And um, there has been a new A-level developed in programming um, <coughs> because young people were coming out of school thinking that an, uh, an ordinary ICT qualification was sufficient when in actual fact it was a user qualification, it wasn't a programming. So there's a lot of work going on in, in ICT, but there is an ICT essential skill. And that's all going to be brought together with apprenticeships? Yeah? Well, I, I need to take that. Moving forward, one of our proposals is that we will be looking to have one award qualification for, apprentice, for each apprenticeship by occupational area, and we're looking at, at, at another of those proposals at establishing a strategic partnership group made up of employers, um, which will be informing the curriculum to make sure that they do have the ICT needed for the particular occupations and jobs of the future. So we're very confident that the issues you've, you've raised will be addressed moving Absolutely. forward. But they are they are a priority within the department even now. I mean, it's not it's not something that we're waiting for the apprenticeship work to feed through. They are a priority. Okay, thank you. Sammy? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Catherine, I, I had asked the, the Minister um, during his presentation about how we target particularly those hard to reach um, young people and we're thinking about needs, and many of them have left school without any, yeah. any qualifications. So, uh, two questions on, on that. But um, is there a progression route for those young people while they're involved in a, a community scheme, whatever, to get to the point where they can actually? Um, get the essential skills uh, so they can actually apply for, for those apprenticeships? There absolutely has to be, yeah. because we cannot have a disadvantaged group of, of society, plus the fact we need those people. And so all of the work that we're doing now has built in within it progression. Um, and I mean, a fundamental, a, a fundamental to all our programmes um, is the essential skill. Yeah. Um, or, or the essential skills of literacy, numeracy and ICT. That's why there's so much work going to be put into the new youth training programme. And even before that at level two, there are young people leaving school who have absolutely nothing. And we need to do work with them. And it's motivating them and it's showing them that um, there are uh, jobs out there that they are interested in and it's getting them engaged. And that's why the work with the communities through Pathways to Success, or our current training for success, um, that work is, is absolutely fundamental. And, and are there models, and again, I think I said this and asked the Minister, are there models out there where you know, other countries have been successful in targeting those young people? Because very often a scheme can say that oh, we're going to target maybe 20 needs to teach young people. Sometimes they find it very hard to actually get them in the front, the front door. Um, well, there's two answers. When we were looking for the apprenticeship programme, we were obviously looking uh, right across the world, but particularly at Europe. And the thing that struck us was that young people in the main leave school ready for an apprenticeship. So there is no point in us looking at those European countries. Yes. Um, America does have some uh, models of good practice, and I looked at them some years ago. I think we need to revisit that. And that is one of the tasks that has been given to the youth training right. team to look, look at look models at of good practice. And indeed, the pathways people, I think, have, have looked. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no doubt about it. Those are the young people, in my view, that deserve the platinum <coughs> treatment yeah. okay. uh, and trying to re-engage re -engage them. Yeah. And just a final very quick question. Um, I, I talk somewhere here about, I think it's, it's, it's um, stage eight, where someone can actually get involved in a PhD. I wasn't quite sure what that what does that actually mean? Well what what we're saying is that um, under the new apprenticeship programme we should not be putting barriers for progression. So uh, a person can start at level three, could start at level four, could start at level five, or indeed could progress to and as, as you know, our minister is very keen that there is equal value given to an apprenticeship mm. as there, there is to um, a, an academic degree, course. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's to allow as well a person who's, who does an apprenticeship programme, um, if, they, if they so desire, I don't know why they would, but if they so desire after they've done an apprenticeship at a particular level mm. to move into full-time higher education, if that's what they would mm. wish to do. 
it means somebody starting at the very bottom of the ladder, some of the people you're talking about, if we get this right have an on our pathway, yeah. they're going to have an aspiration to be the chief yeah, executive of their organisation and go right through and learn right to PhD if they want. That's great. Thanks very much. Now, 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 but I do have to stress, it is not the intention that the public purse will fund right through. I mean, we will fund fully a level three, yeah. but we would have to look at beyond that part Thank funding. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Good morning, Catherine. Good morning. Clearly, uh, when the debate took place, and it wasn't a debate, we were only allowed questions. And I think the chair <laughs> amplified, I suppose, from the committee's perspective, the department were listening to a lot of the issues coming through in the careers inquiry. And there are clearly key elements in this that are most welcome, and they're going to make a valuable contribution to young people's futures going forward. Particularly when the new jobs coming in are going to be consistently IT or ICT and financial services. I'm very keen to hear where the involvement of public sector apprenticeships are going to take place, because clearly that's something that we talked about here. How that's going to take place, is there a buy-in from all the, the government departments? And I want to come back to this on, on some of the points that Sammy made as well, in terms of vulnerable groups as, as well. Um, yes, we are very keen that this is extended out to the public sector. and. Um, Members may be aware that we already have um, a pilot scheme going with a public-private uh, ICT apprenticeship mm -hmm. where half of the apprentices are in the public sector, the other half are in the private sector. They are being trained together on two, in two streams, software development and uh, infrastructure. We have a second group, um, I don't know whether they've started or they're about to start, and that has been increased exponentially. But we see very, very many more opportunities in areas that are particularly in the technical side um, and particularly in areas like forensic science. The fire authority um, is keen uh, to examine this as well. So we're at the early stages, but we are pushing it. Nobody has come and said, no, it won't apply to us. But that's really the work we have to do now as, as we go forward. Well, no doubt, Jane, it's something we'd be very keen to, to support and advocate and champion on your behalf as well. I'm also keen to hear where, you know, when we're talking to town and careers at a career level, either in post primary or those who go on to colleges, for example, how we can ensure that colleges in Northern Ireland are increasing the level of courses to meet the needs of this new. Uh, department Certainly. reported you have, and that's clearly evident as well on the paper. Have you had discussions in colleges to increase the demand for courses? Well, yes, we have, um, and, and <laughs> colleges are keen to do this. Um, and certainly, focusing on level three, that is their bread and butter, but progressing beyond that as well. Um, I, I also think the um, review of careers, which we've started on the back of the work that the committee has, has done will help with that as well. Yvonne, you want to yes. say? Um, with the new model, under our proposals, the job will drive what the provision should be in terms of its content and demand um, and inform the, the provider will be will be part of that partnership to inform the content and make sure it makes employers' needs. And I think it takes your point very well. And we have been engaging with colleges ANI and indeed with the, with the colleges throughout this to make sure that they know our direction of travel. Just, just another question. In terms of traditionally, when we look at apprenticeships, uh, certainly through my generation, it was construction industry, it was engineering, it was the bit, the bricklaying, the electrician, the, the plumbing, and all. I, I don't see that here at all. I don't see any mention of that. Of the traditional apprenticeships, where by one can imagine we are in the construction, as you can see, a particular bad time, and there isn't much an enticement for small employers in particular, but I would like to see that continuing because there is a lack of labour in that particular end, those traditional end of things. But to finish and chair, in terms of the vulnerable groups, I do see this is concentrated on the intermediate and higher level apprenticeships. The Minister has made that clear. I do worry that we're leaving a lot of people behind. And the Minister said there's other areas coming along. I'd want to see another paper where we're trying to ensure Vulnerable groups, marginalised groups, disability, whether it's learning or physical disability, where we're going to bring them into the equation, they're not going to be left further behind. Um, can I take your first uh, yeah. point first about construction and engineering? There is no intention of downplaying those areas at all. It's just we're trying to 
widen the apprenticeship to include many more occupations. And indeed, if you think of Northern Ireland's participation on, the, on world skills, where we have done better than any other region across the United Kingdom against the best in the world, and those are in the traditional industries uh, with apprenticeship, why would we want to, um, uh, to, to uh, downplay them? In fact, what we want to see is the new areas coming up to their standards, um, because we, we have done very well. In terms of the marginal and vulnerable groups, I give you the assurance that through the work that we're doing with the new youth training uh, review, with the work that we're doing on um, pathways to success, and when we review all of that in the round, this is to be inclusive. The last thing we need is for anybody to be left behind. Well, to what I was going to ask is already been asked. Oh. I'll find another couple of questions to ask. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you don't um, have to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> next, next I, have to. <laughs> I, I think there's, there's a couple of things, and it has to be welcome. Then, but I think this committee uh, has, for quite a while, have been concerned that the the, the direction uh, apprentices had went in and the, the disconnect between uh, what was available in industry and. Uh, and Hopefully that, that, that joined up approach and hard start with uh, uh, will be beneficial. I think there's a, there, there's a couple of things. One of the questions that I, I had to ask is that uh, as, as obviously we're catering towards uh, the higher end uh, apprenticeships and jobs that are coming in, uh, but Pat is right that uh, there, there, there is the today, what we call the traditional trades there, uh, that there seems to have been a demise in the level of training. I've been on a couple of training schemes where uh, most of the ones in Brick Lane and Joinery and things are actually have closed because of the downturn in the economy. And when the economy turns around, uh, the, the, it's those type of trades that we need uh, to work. So there needs to be a focus also uh, to ensure that high-level training and apprenticeships are available for, for, for people there also. The only thing that's been raised a, a couple of times also, and I, I, I really appreciate that the focus is on uh, the 18 uh, the 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 the, the twenty four year olds, uh, but there are older apprentices uh, that also need to be con taken into consideration. And it just reminds me that it brought the minister over to stall in the Long Cali at one of one of the events, and the people <coughs> in the baking industry and uh, other industries that uh, may have quite a number of people uh, that are just uh, over twenty four uh, that find it difficult because of a cut of funding uh, that allows allows them to get through. I raised the question about Minister the other day, and, uh, and you spoke about it was uh, the most marginalised in society, and that there's always been that difficult there uh, to get at the needs people uh, with, with, within areas, and what sort of pathway is creating to ensure that uh, that in all this that they are still not the people uh, that are left behind without any future. I, 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 can I start um, back first of all with about your comments about <coughs> employers? The difference between this apprenticeship programme and what we would have had traditionally since I've come into to post, which is quite a long time now, is that the employer is in the lead. It is the employer that will determine, um, unlike at the minute whereby um, a lot of the direction is taken from the providers. And um, so we have learned from that. In terms of the construction, I, I do reiterate that we did have a problem with the economic downturn. People um, voted with their feet that they weren't prepared to go into those industries. Um, I think that landscape's changing, and you'll, I mean, the colleges and certainly our training providers will um, want to go into areas where there is a demand, and the demand is increasing. In terms of your most um, marginalised. Um, I think that the work that we need to do is back in the schools so that we try and work before a young person <coughs> becomes disengaged. And I think a number of the things that are happening within the community on our Pathways to Success programme would have opportunities or would be successful if run in partnership with schools. And that is something which we haven't done, but we should do. We should work with them. I mean, our careers people are going to have a particular role in this, and, and they, as you know, um, 
currently now work with many excluded young people, and we need to ramp that up. Um, so while the apprenticeship is focusing on the intermediate and higher level, if we are not successful with the um, young people and adults who are um, need more help, then we're only going to create more problems for ourselves down the line, and we won't have the workforce coming through. We need to tap into all of the resources. The last um, area that you mentioned, if I can um, drag my memory, is, is to talk about the over 24s, and that is definitely <coughs> taken care of within this. Um, for a long time, uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, I, if you want, I'll pick Go on ahead. Um, um, with age, moving forward with our proposals, we're not excluding anybody, as you'll see. While we expect in the main there will be a focus on young people, as you'd expect with apprenticeships, uh, we are mindful of career changers, and therefore in our proposal um, we are quite clearly saying that it will include all ages. Um, I, th I think the thing that I would say, sorry, Yvonne, is that Minister has said in the components of apprentice, if a person meets those components, then they are apprentice. Irrespective of age. So just a, just a couple of points, and that's interesting because I think one of the the, the, the problems that people faced uh, for the over 24s uh, was uh, I think it was a 50 percent reduction in the funding. Uh, is that being dealt with in this year? And is there is, is, will there be an equal amount of funding available for people who are 24 and over, or firms that want to uh, bring a, a train the people in apprenticeships at different well, uh, fields? First of all, we're working through a new a new funding uh, mm -hmm. model. So I can't give you all the, the whys and wherefore will come to it. But it's, it's important to remember that the reduction in funding, the funding never ever went to the employer. The funding went to the training provider. We didn't provide any funding for employers. Now, this is, while we haven't worked everything through, there will be a new funding model which one of the things that we have to consider is, particularly in SMEs, if we are going to engage SMEs, we may have to, to provide incentives, funding incentives to engage them. But we also have to be, be mindful that we are training an employer's employees and you know, there should be a contribution from the employer as well. Um, but all of that will be taken into consideration as we work through the funding model. But um, we are not intending to cut anybody's funding if they meet the components of the um, that the minister has laid down the seven criteria. Then there is no reason why any age can't access an apprenticeship program. <coughs> and uh, the same thing, and that, that uh, it's in the Rennie Youth Training um, Review, and uh, when will we be getting set off what, what's proposed in that? Because I think that's an, a, a crucial element. Of, of uh, what, what, what uh, we, we we're, we're dealing with, and uh, I think I actually got a we uh, email or text this morning from somebody, and uh, just on the back of this meeting, one of the concerns that the the dad raised and is that the, the any uh, proposal for youth training is affected, uh, it gets to the people that uh, that needs it, but also uh, <coughs> looking into whether the the, the service that's been provided is fit for purpose. That, well. That's absolutely uh, correct. Um, the current model will we can run to 2016, okay? But we will be bringing forward proposals. Um, I'm going to say t uh, April 2014, but in and around that, sometimes time slips. But it will be it will be quick because work has already started, um, and we are mindful. If the apprenticeship is going to be successful, we have to have an equally robust provision for those people who are not yet ready at an apprenticeship stage. Yeah, well, you've done all right for not having any questions. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Thank you, Catherine and Yvonne. Um, just a similar point to Fra regarding funding differences for 24-year-olds. I've obviously raised the issue of 18-year-olds, um, um, because this has been brought to my attention, where they appear to have greater difficulties getting employment as an apprenticeship, because there's an attitude there 
and it's been brought to my attention by some employers, why would I employ an 18-year-old when I can get a 16 and 17-year-old free? And uh, I know Catherine, you mentioned about funding going to the trainer. My understanding is, unless a young person gets that practical experience in a workplace, that qualification is not worthwhile. You know, they don't effectively have one. So again, it's to reiterate the importance of a particular area. And then my second question is, the minister had mentioned, um, you know, about trying to encourage more women into apprenticeships, and I would like to know, you know, has the department any ideas or proposals to to deal with that? Well, if, if I take the first um, question, uh, in terms of, we cannot di dictate to an employer who he or she employs. Um, I don't understand if they are an apprentice. I don't understand the differential in the funding between a 16-year-old and 18-year-old because we don't make any differential. We do over 24. Um, I know that in the past you were concerned that there were people who would have been at school and would have <coughs> qualifications at school and then applied for an apprenticeship and because they already had the qualification they were excluded and we're working through those on an individual by individual basis. That won't happen under the new model, but it will take a couple of years for the new apprenticeship programme to come in. Um, not only do we have funding for through the apprenticeship programme, but we also actually have funding for the training of people who are in work through our skills solutions programme. So if there's any employer who wants to upskill or um, reskill their, their staff, then really? I mean, the department is willing to um, work with them and help them to access training and, and fund it. Um, even when you'll have to take the okay. second one, because I can't remember what it was. We've been working with the Equality Commission. Um, obviously, we'll be looking at um, what we can best do in terms of positive action to get more females, particularly in some of the emerging areas. Um, and there's a range of things we want to be looking at to do that. So we've been taking advice. Um, there are a range of things we can do. We understand that tasters are very good and we're working with them employers and making sure they go out there. Um, probably working through careers, if I'm honest, as well, because if we get the young people at a, an earlier age, we're looking at that UCAS uh, style portal. We're looking at um, uh, central service. All of these things will get females at an earlier stage, particularly, and try to persuade them of, of, of the pathways that they can go on in terms of apprenticeship. So we have a range of things there that I think will be very proactive in terms of uh, increasing female participation, particularly in engineering and the more gender male-dominated areas. Okay. David. Thanks, Chair. And to be honest, Fraz <laughs> touched upon some of my questions. <laughs> I'm not going to grope about and look at anyone. <laughs> I'm very grateful. <laughs> very honest with you. Thank you. So, Debbie, yeah, Thank you. Uh, and again, some of these have been touched on. But the funding model for this new, um, uh, the, the review, whenever it's completed and so forth, and I do notice that you are looking, the, the department are looking to develop a, a model uh, that is best suited to resources, but what about the funding model? Uh, you know, are the department satisfied that they're going to have the funding that's going to meet the needs that's required whenever this new model comes on board? Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, we, we, we know moving forward for um, our European Social Fund bid, um, we are seeking to secure from 14 to 20 uh, a, a total of, I think it is, uh, I'm just 73 it, uh, 73 million. Um, million euros um, and, and we're going to be using that money to support our youth training and our apprenticeships uh, and obviously co-funding that ourselves with 40 per cent ESF money used to support that so that we know already that we've got a commitment in terms of the money um, and we need to work through how we want to best uh, utilize that money in terms of funding apprenticeships and youth training making sure we have a model that is fit for purpose but but I think so also awesome. sorry Yvonne I think also um, Success breeds success, and I think the if well, when this is successful, not if it's successful, then it's much easier to bid for resources if it's really making a, a, an impact on the on the economy. And I think we would be fairly sure 
that we would get the resources that we, we need when the time comes. Yeah. Well then, to make this successful, you're going to need uh, more employers who are willing to open up to take on partnerships uh, or take, take on apprentices. Sorry. And I do know that um, you said earlier you can't fund employers for to train their own employees, which is, which is absolutely right. But at the same time, uh, does there not need to be some incentive there for employers? For example, you know, I've been talking to employers and they, they take on young people and train them, but the difficulty is that they're, they're not getting them at the level that they need them at, in a sense. They, they, they have to step back a year or two and train them, uh, give them training that they should have received at, at a school or college level that they didn't receive, and they're stepping back a year or two to provide them with that, which is an extra and an added cost to them. Now, you know, it's very difficult to get new employers on board if they're going to have to do this and it's going to put an extra cost at them. So, you know, is there going to be any incentive of any kind for, for uh, even to encourage new employers to open up for apprentices? Well, first of all, um, our skills solutions service does fund... Um, and fully fund the upskilling of, of employees or the reskilling. So there, there should be no, and that, that is outside youth training, it's outside the apprenticeship program. That already exists, and our people will go in and work directly with employers to broker the training and get the training that the employer needs. In terms of going forward and incentivising employers, we are very, very conscious that we are an SME economy and we are very conscious that SMEs are reluctant to take on apprentices because there is a, a, there is a perceived risk. And so one of the things that during this consultation period and beyond before implementation is to look at how we can better engage employers and one of those things may be to provide um, financial incentives for them to take employees. Um, <coughs> young people should come to an employer with the employability skills, not necessarily the occupation skills, but the employability skills and the education skills. And I think that is a failure of, of government if they don't, and we should pay for that. Okay. Okay, thanks, Tom. Alistair? Thanks. Um, again, I think Fraz, third or fourth <laughs> final point, I'm not sure which. Which final point it was that, that you got a response to? And following on from Tom about this, I've learned all this, this, this trying to, to try and get enforced. You know? <laughs> on the on the funding model, um, and I take Tom's point about the SME economy and how many of them are looking to then take on apprenticeships. But I think at the same time we need to recognise, and it's in the document about the benefits to employers for taking on yeah. apprentices and the payback that they get on the longer term. And I know you said earlier about we need to make sure that we get the balance right, that we're not effectively putting taxpayers' money in to benefit a company. And I absolutely agree with you. I don't think that's the role of, of government to do that at all. If, if we look at the if we look at the um, the chart that's that's in the document about the Swiss model, it seems to indicate that the, the problem is in the first year. So in the first year, there is no benefit to the employer. After that, then they start to see the the, right. the benefits. And I suppose, particularly for an SME, that's going to cause difficulties because they don't have the cash available, they don't have the, the, the means to do that. So, in terms of any financial incentives, and I know you're reluctant to get into this because there's a consultation, and, but there must be some degree of thinking going on within the department. So, can I ask if, if, if the thinking within the department is that there would only be support for the first year of that, and then the, the company, the employer themselves, have to take it on for the second year? Because I know that the Minister said it would be a, a minimum of two years. That's the first point. And the second point is, in terms of the financial incentives, are we talking about um, providing, for want of a better word, cash to an employer to take on that? Or is there other mechanisms available to us? I mean, is it even possible to look at um, tax incentives for companies who do this? Is there other means of support in terms of you know, a central administrative support that SMEs mightn't have? So it's just the forms that, I'm not asking you which one ultimately the Minister will choose, but what forms of financial support are available to us under the, the systems that we work in here in Northern Ireland? Well, first of all, the off-the-job training will be fully funded at Level 3. I mean, we have to look at Level 4 and beyond because we have to make sure that we don't disincentivise anybody who wants to go to higher education. Yeah. Um, so off-the-job training will, will, for up to Level 3, will be... Or it, 
Level 3 training will be fully funded. In terms of um, incentives to employers, at this stage our, our thinking is at a very early stage, but we are conscious excuse me, that the first year there is a lot of um, additional burden on an employer than what there is in, in years going forward. And in terms of the administrative burden, um, we are looking at, for want of a better word, group, <coughs> group, grouping them together so that we reduce the bureaucracy that an organisation does, the, the administration on behalf of. Now, whether we end up with that, I don't know. We have to examine it. Yvonne's closer to the tax incentives yes. than I am. We're obviously working with our, our colleagues in England, looking at where yeah. they're going forward at the minute. Obviously, tax is, is not devolved. Yeah. So um, we'll be working to see how that works and how it might work for Northern Ireland. But we don't have to do exactly the same, obviously, as our, our neighbours. But we certainly would be wanting to look at anything that would help the system. Is it, is it possible to even well, do that? that? We know that it is possible, but there are some issues that uh, England are looking at that they have some concern around but we're, it's, again they're still, they've had a consultation they believe they can do it through the tax system but they're not just clear what the best route is, being mindful that they have an awful lot of SMEs as well and the payroll systems that would need to support such a model <coughs> um, we're also looking, um, I have to say, at incentives but within the confines of European Social Fund because everything we do has to be mindful of what the rules and regulations are there, um, looking even perhaps we might look at maybe helping some of the apprentices themselves in terms of maybe the, the tools and, and uh, we can do that we can look at that as well, so there's a range of things we want to look at but not necessarily cash in hand but benefits in kind I would describe it as which would help with that first year in terms of an, the encouragement. Um, if we get this right um, through this central service and the promotion and the marketing and uh, working with SMEs to show them the benefits that are we've rightly articulated in this report uh, and see how we can support them with benefits in kind to do that. I, I, we're very confident that we'll have an awful lot more vacancy apprenticeships in Northern Ireland. And in terms of the larger companies that are currently doing their own sort of apprentice schemes, they're not really receiving any taxpayers' money to do it at the moment. Is there a fear that with the financial incentives that will be offered to companies to take on apprenticeships, they'll simply say, well, we're no longer going to fund it ourselves, we'll just go to the taxpayer, and they'll fund their apprenticeship schemes. We, we, we <coughs> see that as a risk and that we're hoping to look at overtraining as well, that there may be benefits in that. And some of the larger firms are delivering their own provision at the minute and are funded. Um, there are very few of the larger firms who are um, doing apprentices completely unfunded. Um, I mean, if you take the bombardiers of this world, they do their, off the, their own um, in company training and they have a, an element of off the job that, that they don't get funded for. But then they work with the like of the Belfast Met. The Belfast Met <coughs> provides the, the training and we currently um, uh, fund that because they themselves have a contract with the department to, to run apprenticeships. Um, as Yvonne says, the idea of overtraining is really attractive because their supply chain, they could be training to yeah. the standards that they want and those people could go to their supply chains. So all of this will be examined in, in the next period of time. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks all. Yvonne, just picking up there slightly, benefits in kind. Well, I'm talking about maybe help with tools we might look at for the apprentice. You know, sometimes if there's uh, costly tools. Uh, we'll be looking at, at how we may do that, not necessarily paying money, but looking at something that would ease the burden for the employer in taking the apprentice on. And that might even be the toolkit for some of the more hands-on type areas. That's come back to the additional sort of skills more so That's that right. Pat was talking about. Be. There, you know, yes, you know. it would be. Uh, just in regard, I think it was the, the final comment the Minister made in the statement was how this all could change with um, George Osborne's review on HMRC and how that looks at apprenticeships. Are you building that? No, I, I, I'm working very closely with England, uh, Scotland, Wales and indeed um, our neighbours in the Republic of Ireland um, but we're working very closely to see how this tax, we've, we've had a teleconference at ministerial level in this very area uh, a week ago we're working very closely to find out how this is progressing and at an official level there's going to be systems put in place to see how we could build our system around this as well It's fair to say that the work I mean, this, this uh, idea of tax incentives came out of a proposal from the UK Commission for Employment and Skills and a report that was led by Nigel Whitehead. Um, and 
the biz officials who will have to work with HMRC to, to do this, um, their thinking is, is very early and they're setting up a working group to um, see how they can make this, this happen. Now, the, the, Yvonne talked about a ministerial um, telekit, but there was also an official telekit kit earlier this week, and they have said they will be mindful of the devolved administrations. I think I would like that a bit stronger, and that the devolved administrations would have a say. Yeah. So, you know, we'll work with Scotland and Wales to make sure that there is a strong voice from the um, devolved countries. Okay. No, it's just when you hear benefits in kind and HMRC yeah. sort of in the same context, it can, get, it can get concerning. So, Catherine and Yvonne, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Okay, members, moving on to our next briefing is the departmental briefing and the summary of responses on the two pay consultation. And just remind members, this will be hand-sorted hand and uh, the packs is page 702 of your pack. Good morning, gentlemen. You're very welcome. Just welcome along Mr. Tom Evans, the Deputy Director of Strategy, European and Employment Relations Division, Mr. Connor Brady, Head of Employment Relations Policy and Legislation Branch, and Mr. Andrew Dawson, Employment Relations Policy and Legislation Branch. Gentlemen, you're very welcome. Thanks. Over to you. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, you know, thanks for the opportunity to come to the committee and uh, provide a briefing on the, the, the GP consultation. Chair, we were with you in, in November of, uh, of 2012 in advance of the consultation just to brief the committee on the areas that were going to be explored. Uh, you have a detailed paper on the, the analysis of the consultation responses. And, and really what I want to do there, I'm going to give a short overview of the, of, of the areas that were explored. And then Connor is going to go into a little bit more detail, not too much, on, on some of the key analysis from the consultation. And then the three of us, including Andrew, who did a lot of the detailed work on, 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 on the, the, this Chupi review, uh, we're, we're able to obviously answer any of the queries that, that the committee will have. In terms of the background, the current Chupi regulations were introduced in 2006 on a UK wide basis, with the exception of the service provision changes that apply here in Northern Ireland. In December of 2011, the, uh, the Department, in conjunction with uh, the GB, Department for Business, Innovation and Skills, issued a call for evidence on the CHIPI regulations. The purpose was to, to really assess the effectiveness of, of, of the regulations as, as they're currently uh, enacted. And basically, the intended effect of the regulations to preserve the continuity of employees' terms and conditions when a, a, an, an effective transfer has happened. And there have been continuing concerns, uh, primarily expressed by employer bodies, which you know obviously it, it, it is of, of significant importance, and that the regulations are too complex, and that they gold plate the the the, the transposition of, of the acquired rights directive, um, and that clear guidance was needed on employers' duties uh, and employees' rights under the regulations. Uh, following an assessment of the responses for the cold evidence, the department again, along with BIS. Uh, issued a UK-wide consultation in 2013, seeking views on, on a range of issues. And, and the main issues are w w uh, w whether there is a need to repeal the service provision change provisions as introduced in 2006, uh, the potential, uh, the need to maybe repeal provisions on employer liability information, possible changes to post-transfer harmonisation, changes to the economic, technical and organisational reasons which uh, restrict changes to terms and conditions following transfer, provision of guidance on the position of agency workers in, in Chippian, you know, given that we transposed the Agency Workers Directive back in, in 2011, changes to the provisions on information and consultation concerning transfers, amendments to recognise that where services are transferred outside the UK and the EU, the, the existing provisions are unrealistic, and guidance a number of other issues uh, around the interrelationship between TUPI and collective redundancies. And uh, you know, the, the consultation uh, 
went out on a UK wide basis, but uh, the, the Minister has decided that, it, that, that actually we, we should provide a, a Northern Ireland response. And we had met with a number of stakeholders on that, and actually the Labour Relations Agency's Roundtable Forum. It was raised with me by the, the Northern Ireland Committee of the Irish Congress of Trade Union, and we confirmed that we would be providing a, a Northern Ireland response. Uh, there are a range of issues. To annex to the paper, which are the kinds of issues that come out of the consultation, which the minister is actively considering now, and and obviously uh, the, the the minister wanted us to come today to, sh to to discuss these with you and to share the consultation, and would be keen to to take the views of the committee, and and following that the minister will take decisions, and then has it given a commitment he has to go back to the executive for any change, any that that would need to be in place. If there are any changes, that will require legislation, and again the committee would have a, a ample opportunity to, to scrutinise and, and have us back to, to, to explore the issues that will be set out in draft regulations. I'm going to hand over to Connor now. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, I mean, if the committee would like, I can give a brief overview of each of the issues which are currently in the department's thinking, which the minister um, is looking at at the moment. I mean, you have more detailed assessment in the paper, but I can just give a yep. very brief overview yep. if that Fine. would be helpful. Fine. I'll try and keep it quite simple because we fully appreciate Chupi is a very complex area, so I've, I've tried to phrase it in a way that I can understand as much as anything. But you were referring to the members? <laughs> Not at all. Um, on collective agreements, um, at present there is no limit on the length of time that a transferee must honour the terms and, and conditions agreed as part of a collective agreement prior to the transfer. We are therefore considering whether to amend the Chupi regulations to allow a renegotiation uh, of terms derived from collective agreements one year after the transfer, but that is provided that the overall change is no less favourable to the employee. In addition, we are considering providing a cut-off point for the transfer of terms derived from collective agreements. This amendment would mean, would mean that only those collective agreements agreed at the date of transfer and not subsequently would bind the transferee. On economic, technical or organisational reasons, under Chupi, where the sole reason or principal reason for a dismissal is the transfer itself, where it's connected with the transfer. The dismissal is treated as automatically unfair for the purposes of unfair dismissal law, unless there's what we call an ETO, that's an economic, technical or organisational reason for uh, changes uh, in the workforce. Over the past few years, the court's interpretation of this provision has not included changes in place of work. This means that if, because of the transfer, the transferee employer intends to carry on the business in a different location, but, the same, but with the same number of staff overall, then any dismissals as a result of the change of location would be, would be automatically unfair. We are therefore considering an amendment which would prevent genuine uh, place of work redundancies from being automatically unfair. Under the regulations, an employee's terms and conditions cannot be varied, even if both parties agree to any such change, uh, if the variations are connected with the transfer itself. Uh, we therefore consider that the current restriction in the regulations which applies here is too broad, and we are considering whether to amend it in order to bring it closer to the language of the Acquired Rights Directive, which the regulations transpose, as well as Court of Justice of the European Union case law. The regulations also treat a dismissal as unfair if the sole or principal reason for that dismissal is the transfer itself or a reason connected with the transfer that is not an ETO reason entailing changes in the workforce. Again, as with changes to terms and conditions, we, we consider that this provision is too broad and in considering again whether to bring it closer to the language of the Acquired Rights Directive uh, as well as case law from the Court of Justice of the European Union. We also want to try and provide some further clarification on service provision changes. Case law has established that part of the test of whether a Chupi service provision change occurs is whether the activities carried on after the, the, the transfer are fundamentally or essentially the same as those that are carried on before the transfer. What we are therefore considering is whether to make an amendment which re reflects this approach which, which has been set out in case law. With regard to the requirement to consult representatives of employees in a Chupi transfer, it has been argued that this does not work very well in smaller or non-unionised workplaces where they do not have a formal, um, formally elected employee representatives. What we are therefore considering is amending the regulations to allow micro-businesses to inform and consult directly uh, with employees when there is no recognised independent union or existing employee representatives. 
On employee liability information, the regulations currently require a transferor to, to provide certain employee information to a transferee 14 days before a relevant transfer. We are considering whether to extend this to 28 days in order to provide the transferee company with the information further in advance that they can make the necessary uh, changes or, or implementations for those employees. In addition to that, we're looking at the interaction between CHUPI and collective redundancies legislation. Whilst the CHUPI transfer cannot itself constitute grounds for dismissal, redundancies connected to the transfer can occur where there's the previously mentioned ETO reason. Where the potential for redundancies is likely to exceed 20 at one establishment, the duty to consult employee representatives in respect of the redundancies is likely to apply. What this means is that there are two separate duties on the employer to consult and what we actually want to do or what we're considering is an amendment which would make it clear that consultation by the transferee which begins pre-transfer can also count for the purposes of complying with the collective redundancy rules as a way of streamlining um, consultancy requirements. What we're also doing, and this is coming directly from uh, feedback from consultees, is considering work to improve actually chupy guidance so that businesses genuinely understand uh, how to conduct a transfer fairly and in the most effective way. Finally, the department's considering taking no action in certain areas. In particular, we're considering retaining the service provision uh, change rules because feedback from consultees or the majority of consultees is this provides clarity in terms of when a GP transfer actually occurs. We're also considering keeping the position whereby a transferor cannot rely on a transferee's ETO reason to dismiss an employee prior to a transfer. And finally, we're considering retaining the wording of one of the provisions so that where a transfer leads to a substantial change in working conditions to the material detriment of an employee, the contract of employment may be treated as having been terminated. So that sets out what the department's thinking is as a result of assessing the responses from consultees, particularly Northern Ireland consultees. And as Tom mentioned at the outset, we're happy to take your views on any of that. We, we fully appreciate this is complex area of law, um, but if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. In regard to extending terms and conditions for one year and guaranteeing, guaranteeing those, uh, most two-pay contracts are in, really in the service areas, you know, there's catering, security, cleaning provisions. By guaranteeing those terms and conditions for one year, is that going to affect the number of contracts that can be t potentially transferred under two-pay? Because it's the manpower, it's the, the service, or it's the, the wage bill is the main cost to any overhead there. We don't, we don't think that it would affect that. Um, in fact, the, the purpose of all, all of the changes sort of together are to try and encourage uh, more, up to, uh, more easier streamlining of um, to be transfers and things. So uh, take, taking the package together as a whole, including the, in relation to, to limiting collective agreements for one year, we, the, the, the effect will hopefully be to, to streamline the process. I mean, what, what the, the overall underlying principle of what we're considering on the back of this consultation is taking a pragmatic approach on the back of the directive. I mean, if we look at the directive itself, its driving principle is to protect um, those employment rights in a transferee um, position or, or, or occupation. So what we're, what we're actually trying to do is, is work out how we can ensure that there's a fair balance in terms of retaining all of those employment protections but also ensuring that those employment, the retention of those employment protections don't act as a barrier to businesses who, who would wish to take over uh, in a true transfer situation. So it's about trying to find that delicate balance between ensuring that there's better regulation, i.e. that it doesn't provide a barrier, but ensuring that rights are maintained for, for employees and workers. Uh, after that one year, sorry, sorry Tom, um, after that one year you're saying that the terms and conditions should be no less favourable. Who will judge that in your view? That could only be the tribunals. I mean, in, when it comes to employment law, the tribunal system is the ultimate ar arbiter of what is fair and reasonable, what is overall no less detrimental. They can only be um, the arbiters in, in that particular case. But, but in terms of the, you know, at the, you know, when the transfer is happening, those issues would have to be explored in the understanding of what the terms and conditions are. And go back to your earlier point about um, you know the numbers. I mean, 
in, in, you know, when, pe when people are taking on a new, uh, this new service, there, they, they may, there may be a change in the numbers of people delivering that service, which have been environmental, uh, uh, economic, technical, or, or organisational reason, and that's provided for in the regulations. And so, uh, as I say, the issue actually that we're bringing forward is that a change in location actually now may come in, may come into the equation. Uh, I'm just trying to get my head around this. So, so when a new, a new company takes on a two-pay contract, they will up front tell the employees that a year down the line, your terms and conditions will be changing to A, B or C to enable them then to enter into labour relations at that stage, or will it be only after a year into the contract? There would be no duty to, for the there, no duty. to tell up front. It would just allow them after one year to then renegotiate a collective agreement. Right, so a year into the new contract, they can yeah. start to change terms and conditions. But yeah. there's a no detriment basis as yes. well. You know, that, yeah. that's, that, that would but be again, And I mean, in terms of a transfer, there's the whole due diligence process that happens. I mean, before a, a, a company would take on, mm -hmm. they would you know, need to understand exactly what the terms and conditions are and understand what they are. And, yeah, but it's more from the employee point of view as well. Yeah, yeah, that's but, what I'm, yeah, I'm trying to clarify there. Uh, under your, your ETO reasons, um, <laughs> by, are you suggesting you're going to amend ETO reasons or to include location, or are you going to do away with, with some of them as well? No, the, the proposal, and it, well, I say proposal at this stage, it's what's within the department's thinking, and again, I have to emphasise the Minister you know, hasn't given any agreement to this. What we're proposing is to add to the ETO reasons to in, ensure that where there is a change in location of the workforce, but the overall workforce numbers remain the same, that, that in that situation, that's added to the list of ETO reasons. Change in location, is that a change in location for the contract or the individual? Um, that would be for, will be for the, the overall the location of the workforce. workforce. For the workforce. Right. Uh, in regard to, I just note some of the comments there that the, the repeal of Regulation 49 and 410 and the amendment to the definition of an ETO could have a disproportionate impact of employees and protected characteristics such as disability and those with childcare commitments am I, amounting to indirect sex discrimination not come forward from RCM. How do you see that playing out in these regulations? At the, at the present time, Regulation 4 is drafted uh, so that it goes beyond the, the scope of the directive. The directive itself is compliant with sex discrimination uh, legislation across the EU. So if, we, if we're just re repealing that element of gold plating, as it were, uh, then we're, we're, it would still, in the Department's view, be compliant with um, equality legislation. It would, it would be, as, as per, that's the sections that are being perceived by employers as gold plating. Uh, yes, any, uh, that has been the view of employers expressed that anything that has gone beyond the directive, and in particular Regulation 4 was identified as a key one, then that is gold plating in, in the eyes of some employers. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the, the presentation so far. I'm not quite sure which Connor or Andrew that my question um, refers to in terms of the ETO reasons. Now, obviously, when you make rules and regulations and directives, there's always exceptions to the rule. So I'm just asking about um, some sort of flexibility. Let me, let me give you an example. Um, not so long ago, someone came to me who were going through this whole situation of Tupi. And this guy had been a member of the security forces, was asked to go into another area where he'd actually been threatened. His life had been threatened. And it was very, very difficult for the employee to change. To, to change. Got, uh, uh, what he was saying was, look, I'm afraid of going there, but secondly, also want um, redundancy. So, so um, how would you answer that situation? I think that would, uh, that would come down to a matter for advice for that individual, and also then, if it got as far as tribunal action, it would have to be decided by a tribunal. A tribunal. Um, it, it, there would be nothing in, in the, the legislation itself which would deal with that particular kind of individual case, flexible, case. Though, yeah. I, I would say that that would go to a tribunal for mm. determination. Okay. I mean, I, I would just say, I mean, we, we try whenever we're, we're writing legislation to cover in, in broad brush terms yeah. as many different situations as we can, but obviously there are exhaustive lists as yeah. to what can be specifically addressed within the legislation, so there will all, there'll always be individual cases yeah. Yeah. which aren't directly addressed within the legislation, but as Andrew mentioned, that's for the, uh, the tribunal system to, to try and assess where, where within that matrix they, fix, they fit. Yeah. 
And that particularly is around the change in location, and yeah. the person not being, yeah, well, again, that is, that's where actually we're, we're, we're looking to actually include a change in the economic uh, reasons. I suppose, Tom, um, in the situation, um, even previous was past year, people moving from one location to another um, can be quite difficult. There can be a fear factor um, from, from both sides of the community. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it can be a big factor. Yeah, I think it's a change. It, it's it's an issue in a, in all sectors, even mm -hmm. the public sector, moving public when, when, right. when there's restructuring and re movement. Yeah. Yeah. The, these are always difficult issues that need to be Understand. worked through. Okay, yeah. Pat. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, just some, some general points. When the amendments were tabled to to the consultees and they made the submissions, has the department reflected on some of the concerns raised within the submissions and amended some of the proposed changes? One um, of the, the key areas we looked at was repealing the service provision change elements of, of TUPI. So that, for example, when a cleaning uh, contract changed hands within um, a, a building, um, then the, the employees there would be protected uh, under TUPI. Uh, the, the service provision change elements are what can be described as gold plating of TUPI 2 because nowhere in the, the acquired rights directive does our service provision change is covered. In the UK, service provision changes are covered under cheapy protections. Um, employers had initially said that um, the, the service provision changes provisions should be repealed because they were an added burden on business. Whenever the consultation proposals went out, uh, trade unions and, and employee representatives were, were very concerned to keep uh, service provision change elements. Some employers actually came back having reconsidered and said that uh, service provision change elements should be kept because they provide added certainty for employers, even though they uh, are an element of gold plating of the directive. So, whilst initially repealing the service provision change elements was a was a, a real uh, a potential um, runner in this, uh, we've kind of looked at it now, and employers and some um, some employers and all employee representatives are are convinced that they, those provisions should in fact be be retained. Uh, and thereby, the, the, therefore, protections would continue to apply to those affected workers. Just to add to that, if I might quickly, um, we, we refer to gold plating, and I think the term gold plating is always seen as being a negative term, um, particularly by employer representatives. But there are arguments that in certain situations for both employees and employers, gold plating can be a good thing. There is necessary gold plating, so it's not we, we you know we don't labour under the assumption that all gold plating is bad. And the service provision changes is one of these areas where employees, as well as a significant number of employers, said, "Well, it, yes, it is gold plating, but it's justifiable and worthwhile gold plating." My concern, and Chair, I haven't to be quite honest, we had the full document, but it would appear to me that the gold plating there is concern from those employee representative groups that there could be removal of certain elements of the gold plating, that they have fundamental differences with some of the proposed amendments. Would that be fair and reasonable? Yep, that, that would be. So, so in reflecting, and I think, Chair, you know, once it comes to a further stage, whatever this department views, I think we would need to be seeking guidance from either the law centre or some of the employer, employer bodies as well uh, going forward, because we wouldn't do it justice just be given a nod and a wink today to the department because I am concerned of a number of areas that the law centre has raised, for example, and the Royal College of Nursing as well. So uh, the jury is out as far as I am concerned. I would, I would like to think that the department would reflect further on some of the fundamental submissions. Uh, abs absolutely. I mean, at, at this stage, we're simply reflecting on the submissions which have been received during the consultation. Ultimately, as I'm sure you appreciate, it will be up to the minister to decide the direction of travel. But the committee obviously. Whatever ministerial decisions are taken, um, whatever emerging legislation comes out of this, uh, we would welcome the committee's in increased attention on, on every piece of legislation in this respect. So, you know, the guarantee obviously is there that every opportunity be given to the committee to comment further on it. I mean, not, sorry, just not to single out any consultancy in particular, but we, we were very impressed by the law centre's yeah. response to this because they not only looked at the, the issues in the round, but they also brought in analysis of case law and also evidence from their case working, uh, which we find really useful just in, in that. 
developing the consultation response. Uh, but, Chairman, we're, ha we're having further discussions. Actually, we're having a, a meeting with the Northern Ireland Committee, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, and, and the reality is, in all of the, I mean, employment law actually is quite a divisive, it, it's surprising divisive well, no area, because you know we, we go to one forum and they're saying there's not enough protection. And you go to another forum, which is the employer body, and the, sin, and, and the minister has that really difficult process of trying. And I think the, the, the issue around, I think, which Connor has, has raised, around, in, 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 in summary, the, the, the service provision, the, the importance of retaining them. The employers, for, say, because of clarity and they're comfortable and understand them, so actually change in that would be unhelpful. But that's a a significant protection, and it's a, you know it's a significant. So in essence, the amendments is here today. They, they could be redrafted. There could be another draft. In essence, would that be fair? They, they, they could be changed somewhat, reflecting on if you're having further meetings with people. Well, and we've received that back to the minister. We have to go to the minister. When it's the minister, obviously, will we'll have to take the, the make us the, the, the decision on that, and then he'll have to take it to the executive. This this was the consultation, the, the agreement to go out to consultation because of the cost-cutting nature of it went to the executive. So he'll have to go back to okay. the executive. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any other business? Members, if not, date and time the next meeting will be 10 a.m. room 29 Parliament Buildings, Wednesday, 22nd of January. Members will now move on to close session.